Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. All right, so um, we're going to Portugal. Now what's cool about this is it's still the 11th of July. So uh, the 9th of July, I went up to Austin to do a master class or to attend a master class uh, with Master Psalm Chris Tangi uh, from Guild Psalm and it was all about Portugal. And uh, it was pretty cool. So. Uh, I'll probably post pictures of these and tag him in that a little bit later. Um, so let's do some Portuguese wine. So first of all, Portuguese wine is just, we're, we're used to it being port, right? Like that's what Portuguese wine is, right? No, I mean, they have wines all over the country. They have the very northern part is like, so hopefully I have a map of Spain, Portugal, you know, the Iberian Peninsula there. But Portugal is like that westernmost part of the Iberian Peninsula, and there's a little part on the very top that's Spain, okay? And so we know that is Galicia, Galicia, uh, and the wine area of Rias Baixas, and they make Albarino there. Well, they also, on the other side of the border, make, you know, um, a wine called Vino Verde, and well, what do you know, the grape is Alvarinho. Same grape, just you know, Portuguese is a little different than a little bit different than uh, Spanish. I like to. It's a gross oversimplification, but I like to say that Portuguese looks like Spanish but sounds like Italian. It's kind of really weird. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to pronounce uh, some of these Portuguese names. I, I have Google Translate up to help me with the pronunciations if I kind of forget how to do it. Um, but Portuguese is Portugal has been a value wine area for a long time. I remember Gary like back in frick 06, 07 talking about how Portugal was like the next like value wine destination and it's still a value wine destination. Uh, and a destination too. I mean, I haven't been there, but um, uh, Chris Tangi was talking about it's relatively cheap to go there um, to vacation and stuff like that. So, uh, but the wines, you know, you get some spectacular wines without spending a whole lot of money. So they have, so we have Alvarinos, so the Vino Verdes, uh, we have Port. We also have just regular, just non-fortified wines, red and white. Um, the ones that we're gonna do here are all from the almost southernmost part, part of Portugal. But then there's also an area called Madeira and the Azores, which we're not gonna have any, we're not gonna have any wine from the Azores. But Madeira, like the wine of the United States, like we kind of built the United States on that wine. Um, another fortified wine, dessert wine. So, um, and I had some of that too, great stuff. So, but we're gonna concentrate on this. So these are all white wines and the, the overarching theme, and all these came from, again, my good friends over at Creative Palette. Um, the, the over, arching theme of this is there's um, oh yeah I guess it's yeah I might pronounce it right um, there's a grape that's in all of these one of them is a hundred percent of the grape the others the other three are uh, combination or are are blends and this one grape is in all of them um, and town vas I think I said it right I should have had Google translate work on that for me but we're gonna we're gonna type it in real quick Da, 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 da. We got a little tilde over it. Where is it? Right there. Boom. And then da da da. And we're gonna have Google Translate pronounce this for me. Entalvas. 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 Uh, the A is wrong. Hold on. I don't have the correct. I don't have the correct little, here we go. That's it. Now let's see if I pronounce it right. Anton Vaz. Anton. So 
it's easier to see on this one because it literally says it on there. So when you have the little tilde over the A and then it starts with an O, it, it's um, not ow. So Antom Vaz is the grape that's in all of these. This is the one that's 100%. And uh, so we're going to get to it. Um, most of these are in the 12 and $13 range. This, uh, let's see which one. This one is $22. So um, let's just get into it. Uh, I got a lot of tabs open here. So I'm going to try to make sure I get to the, you know, get to going here. Um, there isn't necessarily a, a, an order to do this. So um, I'm going to do it from, from here to here. So I got to make sure I get the right. Da, da, da. All right. So first up, first up is the 2017 Montevelo, uh, Montevelo uh, from, oh, and, and so this is uh, the Alentejo, not down, Alentejo, Alentejo uh, is the area, but it's also known as the Alentejano. Um, Area and most of these all say Alentejo, not Alentejano, so it's kind of confusing on it. But um, so it's got uh, in town vase, uh, Rupiero, and Pedum are the grapes in this one. So there's only three grapes in this one. Uh, the in town vase is 40 percent, the Rupier, Rup Rupero is 40 percent, and the Pedum is 20 percent. Uh, this is Mario, no, the Montevelo. This is twelve dollars suggested retail on that, and let's check it out. Uh, so, let's give you a little background. So, there's there's a gentleman named David Baverstock. He is from Adelaide, Australia, mate, and um, he's been making wine at this winery, which is the Esperam. It's Esperam. Uh, it says Portugal's leading family owned estate since 1992. I mean, these are all like, you know, the text sheets and the biographies, you know, that the wineries write. So they're all going to make themselves sound really great because they probably are. Um, so uh, he grew up amongst the vines and has a natural interest in love and wine. Uh, he studied enology at Roseworthy Agricultural College in his hometown of Adelaide. And... Um, his first job as a winemaker was at Saltram Wine Estates in the Barossa, the Barossa Valley. Um, and then um, he uh, traveled to Europe in the 1980s. Um, so uh, he found, he eventually got to Portugal and uh, he moved to the country in 82. And um, he met his wife, uh, a Lisbon native. Uh, and settled in the Douro and worked for Symington, which is like, like an awesome, like wine company. Uh, they make a lot of stuff uh, and they own and partner with a lot of people. And uh, in 1992, he took the, he took the position of head, wine, head winemaker at Herdaja do Esparom. Esparom. Let me try it again. Herdaja, and I had Google Translate. Tell me this. Do Espadom. If I pronounce it wrong, I'm really sorry. Uh, and it's in the Alentejo region, southern Alentejo region. And then, um, let's see here. He streamlined their style, retained the traditions and soul of, of Alentejo. And then, um, let's see, they purchased uh, the Quinta dos Mursas, uh, in the Douro, so he went up to the Douro to make more wine up there, and um, he's been making wine to there, and then he said he remained in charge of the estate from 08 to 14, and winemaker Jose Luis Morea da Silva has since taken over at that estate. He is now the chief winemaker uh, at Esperam, Esperam. Um, and uh, he was responsible for overseeing the production of all their wines, and he's assisted by Sandra Alves. Alves? I think it's Alves, because it's ES, I think it's a sh. 
Uh, anyway, he says, uh, winemaking philosophy combines sustainable methods and a holistic approach to winemaking with scientific and empirical research. He's also been named the winemaker of the year three times by the Portuguese wine magazines uh, Revista de Vinhos and Wine. So two different magazines. So let's see the text sheet. Let's get into this. Uh, so the harvest year for 2017, right, 17, said it was a, another drier than average winter with low rainfall, um, abnormally hot spring, which brought forward uh, bud burst. The hot weather continued throughout the spring and into the summer and allowed for good ripening conditions and healthy fruit, although vineyard irrigation was essential. Uh, the hot weather in the early part of summer brought the vintage forward and picking started during the first week of August. In other words, they, they had to start harvest early. Um, the hot, dry weather continued throughout August, September, although there was no extreme heat, allowing for fully matured fruit uh, and relatively high alcohols. Yields were down generally by up to 20%, and juice extraction in the winery was lower than normal, so they had lower yields. Um, let's see here. The soil type, and this is going to be pretty much everywhere when I, so I'm not going to do the soil type at all four of the wines, but... If the text sheets had the soil type, it's pretty much this. Uh, schist granite uh, origin with clay loam soils. Uh, in this case, the average vine age is 17 years. Uh, they destem, they chill the must, they do uh, what's called membrane pressing. So I guess there's a membrane, they press as a membrane that I guess kind of filters. That's my understanding. Uh, cold settling, temperature control of fermentation in stainless steel tanks. They do centrifuging, which helps um, get rid of the solids. Uh, they do cold stabilization, which almost everybody does. Uh, membrane filtration prior to bottling. So they do some filtration and they do some centrifuge to get the solids out. Basically like a clarification. Um, let's see. So let's check out the wine. Oh, and the, I'm guessing that this winery was established in 1267. This is 1267. I didn't, I should have looked that up. Smells wonderful. So I get uh, I get some like honeydew, some cantaloupe, some peach, some guava. It's really clean. Um, no evidence of oak because there's none. Yeah, and the fruit is really like fruit's actually like ripe and fresh, like like you 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 got it like right off the tree or the vine or whatever whatever or however the fruit's grown. stalling all right um anyway not because i was trying to taste wine i was trying to look up the um the winery anyway um the palate is very much like the nose it's really tasty uh the fruit is actually really ripe um so the heat you know the hot summer the you know the the hot vintage is really coming through so in many ways it tastes new world because of the ripeness of the fruit. Um, the acidity though is actually pretty good. It's not screaming high, but my mouth is watering, so they, they retain some good acidity. Um, it's got a really good mouthfeel, and um, yeah, it's it's really tasty. Thank goodness they have an English site. Um, because while I could stumble through Spanish, French, and Italian, kind of, yeah, there's, no way I could have stumbled through. Uh, no way I could have stumbled through the the Portuguese version of the site. Anyway, it's really tasty. So let's see if I can just kind of quickly through. I'm just really looking for the number twelve sixty seven to see if it's. Hmm. I don't see anything right now, but anyway. This is an outstanding wine for $12.
Like, it's really, really tasty. I really like it. Like, I really want to spit it out. But I have a lot of wines to do tonight, so I have to. And speaking of a lot of wines to do tonight, let's move on. But real quick, so I forgot to say it. Remember this last week? Or not last week, and I'm in two days. The last episode, vegan friendly. Let me talk about that real quick. Vegan friendly. So I think I kind of talked about this one of the other episodes prior. Um, so vegan friendly um, is talking about how um, there's some tower there. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about trying to look up the rest of that. So when they when they uh, clarify wines, what they do is called fining or clarification. Sometimes they use things like egg whites and isinglass, which is fish bladder. So these are not vegan friendly. They're, it's animal, pro, animal protein, animal product. So if it says vegan friendly, they, they either didn't do any fining or they maybe they, maybe they do centrifuge or maybe they did di, diatomaceous earth or some other fining agent that takes the big solids out um, uh, instead of animal products. So... Uh, Wineries that do that don't always put vegan friendly, but if they put vegan friendly, then you know that you don't have to worry about that. And if you're allergic to eggs, like I ran into somebody the other day when she was like, oh, every time I drink, you know, blah, 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 this happens to me, but if I drink this one, it doesn't. That's why, because she's allergic to eggs. All right, so let's move on. So the we're going to do the Mariana. Um... This is the 2017 also. Boom. Get a little closer there. The, the, the foil kind of is messed up and keeps poking me. So this is also, this is $13. And let me pull up. We can start closing these tabs out because I don't need them open anymore. Boom. Close. There we go. I gotta find the right, the right one here. Here we go. So um, this is from uh, the. Oh, also here are they both from the same winery? I probably should have looked this up beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is it, it's the same name. So this is the Herdash do Rosim. Uh, so this is a, a state located between, uh, man, Vinigueta and Cuba. And I'm sure there's like, it's like a town called Cuba in Portugal. Um, and also in the lower Alentejo, size of 120 hectares, 70 of which are vineyards and 10 of olive trees. Uh, the Vitigeta is a Vitigeta Fault, a natural landmark, which marks the border between the upper and lower Alentejo, determines the... Raison d'Atre, they use French this time, of Vitigeta, uh, the southernmost wine producing subregion of Alentejo. The east west facing escarpment of around 50 kilometers in length defines the climate, and despite its deep lying southern location, makes it one of the most temperate subregions of Alentejo. At the winery, they always respect the natural vocation of the region's terroir, producing fresh, yeah, okay. Elegant Ruminal Wines. Uh, the head winemaker uh, is Pedro Ribeiro. Um, he's also the general manager. And uh, let's see here. I'm trying to just kind of go through any, any of the other highlights. Yeah, all right. So let's talk about the wine itself. So um, let's see here. It has the Untaum Vaz. Arento and Alvarino are the three grips. So we got the three A's going on here. And let's see what else can we talk about on the tech sheet here. So they have manual harvest in 12 kilogram boxes after a selection on a vibrating sorting table. The grapes underwent cold maceration. Fermentation took place in small capacity stainless steel tanks. Um, they don't say what the capacity is. And uh, for 21 days. And they're aged five months in stainless steel tanks and two months in bottle. Alrighty. Bam. Put this 
back here. I'm excited to try this. I got a lot of wine to drink now. That's why I really like to try to do all these reviews because, and that's why I have a Corvin, because then I can take months to drink the wines instead of trying to drink, you know, 20 wines in five days. All right, so that's got a little bit of a different aroma to it. It's got a touch more floral, a little orange. Uh, the, the cantaloupe melon honeydew really isn't there. Um, yeah, it's a little more of the orange color of the fruits. A touch of floral, somewhat minerally. But yeah, fresh, vibrant. Super tasty. This one's a little more crisp, a little um, higher acidity, um, sharper, um, crisper is a good way to put it. Um, the fruit's a little more tart tasting because of the acidity, so it's not as fresh and, and ripe as this one. Um, it's in, in some ways a little more refreshing. It's a little more linear, a little cleaner. This is a little um, bigger mouthfeel. Um, this is, you know, leaner. Um, it's also got a little bit of like green apple, but also almost like almost a little bit of grassiness to it. It's super tasty and it's 13 bucks, man. It's really nice. I like it a lot. All right onward through the fog all right Woo. next one we're gonna do here is this this one no boom no here we go all right so this is it's kind of a weird because this the front label looks like a back label but that's the back label this is the front label back front back front anyway um what we look at the back label to see, which is really the front label legally. Uh, so this is the 2018 Fita Preta. Uh, yeah, Fita Preta. Boom. And this retails for $22. Uh, let's see here. So we're going to read the bio. Now I'm going to kind of edit this because it, they use a lot of um, superlatives to describe everything. Um, anyway, Antonio Massanita um, is the winemaker and they've given him, they, 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 they are describing him as a cult of personality. But it says he's young, brilliant, dynamic, and multifaceted. He makes wine uh, in the Alentejo, the Azores, and also the Douro. Um, the breadth of style he achieves in these three markedly different regions is nothing short of breathtaking. Um, I mean, I just want to meet this guy because, I mean, if he's like this cool, like, heck yeah, I want to meet him. Uh, he learned to make wine all over the world before returning home to Portugal, and the variety of his experiences are clearly brought to bear in his winemaking. He excels at distilling the essence of a place and expressing its zenith. All right, so the wine, the winery background... Fita Preta is a combination of a partnership between a young, dynamic Portuguese winemaker and a British-born viticulturist dedicated to a new examination of terroir in Alentejo. Um, Antonio uh, returned home to Portugal after making wine in Napa, Australia, and France. Uh, he made wine uh, at uh, Lynchbage in, in Bordeaux. David Booth, the viticulturist from England, um, was already well established in Portugal when they began to work together in 2004. Uh, the winery operates on the Portuguese idea of papite, um, I'm pretty sure I got it right, or intuition when it comes to their uh, viticulture and winemaking. Let's see here. With this trust of the land and the natural growth process of the vineyard, they are, um, they are able to make wines that are imbued with a singular sense of place, 
They operate on a strictly gravity-fed basis uh, in the winery to avoid any harsh treatment of the must. All wines are spontaneously fermented with indigenous yeast. Small parcels of each vineyard are fermented separately to preserve distinct stylistic qualities. And then they are blended to achieve a layered complete picture of the terroir. So let me explain what gravity fed is. Um, if you ever saw my um, interview uh, at um, Palmaz, uh, that was a gravity-fed winery, and basically in that particular winery, it's a big mountain, so they bring the they bring all the grapes to the very top of the mountain, at the very top, at the top of the winery, which is in the mountain, and everything's just everything just goes down one level. Like so, the grapes are are dropped into the into the crusher, the stemmer, and all that. Well, actually, they're, I think there's a stem up top, but they're they're dropped into the crusher, or the press. They're pressed in. They get the juice that drops into the tank, and and at Palmaz, the tank is on this big carousel. So like 25 tanks, and they just rotate them. So the the the, the where the grapes are dropped is stationary, and they, they move the tanks on this big carousel. Okay, and then once they're done with the tanks, then it gets dropped again. So that's the idea. So you never use a pump. And so is is that is that something that's really a big deal? It can be. Um, some people think that using a pump, no matter how gentle the pump is, um, just kind of messes up, messes with the grapes and the taste and all that. Other people are like, no, man, it's okay. So, um, so you got that. All right. So let's see the grape varieties. We got a lot on this one. All right. So we have Rupero, Rabo de Ovela, Entaum Vaz, Tamarez, Alicante Bronco, which is, Bronco is white in Portuguese, and Arinto. So we got a lot of stuff. Let's see here. Um, all bunches are inspected for quality on a sorting table before they are gently whole cluster pressed at low temperature. Suspended solids are allowed to settle naturally before fermenting uh, the juice in the stainless steel tanks. Um, in the vineyard, the ripening months in southern Portugal's Alentejo region are hot and dry with cold nights. The vines grow on infertile, rocky schist soils, naturally producing low yields of concentrated fruit. Grape quality is assured by management practices. They don't explain what those are. Uh, at harvest, the grapes are selectively hand-picked into small boxes at their peak maturity. Um, yeah, so let's check it out. So this is kind of more peach driven. I do get a little bit of melon. Not so much on the orange. Maybe a touch of nectarine on it. Again, very clean smelling, but it's not as aromatic as the other two. It's still aromatic, but not as aromatic as the other two. It's kind of funny because this is almost like a, a kind of a in between. The, this is kind of like an in between these two, but it's also a little bit richer. It feels a little bit more elevated in style, uh, in quality, um, and just in flavor. Um, it's it's a little prickly, like the acid isn't as high as a Mariana. Uh, I think I just lucked out in how I how I sorted how I put these with the order I put them in. It also, there feels there feels to be though a little bit more oomph to it, um, almost. Um, and I wonder if it's if it's resting on lees, you're getting like a little bit bigger mouth feel out of it, almost a, um, I mean a leesy quality, but like almost like a bready quality. Yeah, I mean, it's a more complex wine. It has a better mouthfeel. It's a smoother mouthfeel. It's delicious. It's really good. I mean, it's $22. So, again, like I was talking about last episode with you know, Argentina and a $25 wine probably made elsewhere would be more money. 
this for sure would be made, this would be worth more money. Um, I'm not saying it would be like dramatically more, but I could see this again being that 30-ish dollar price range if it was not made in Portugal. It's, 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 a, it's a bit of floral to it too. It's almost Viognier-like. Super tasty. I really like it. I like all the wines so far. All right, so let's get into uh, last wine. Oh, nope, I gotta keep that one. All right, so this is the 2016 um, Entown Vaz da Pequegina. I don't know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take the time to get Google Translate to, to work on it. Um, so this is from um, the Malhadina Winery. And let's see here. Nope, not that. Nope, I need that. I don't need that. I think this one doesn't really have, I think this is the one that didn't really have a, um, um, a, I think this, this, this one only had like text sheet. I didn't really have anything else for it. So, all right, so uh, the grapes are matured uh, so schist-based soil, 100% uh, Entown vase, uh, schist-based soil. I think it already says 87 acres. Uh, grapes are mainly picked in the early hours of the day and put into boxes of 12 kilograms, like another one was. After selection and sorting, the grapes were removed from their stalks, no, so they, they were destemmed, uh, and gently pressed. Fermentation at low temperatures in stainless steel tanks. Um... Just under 14,000 bottles. And that's all I can tell you because the rest is the actual tasting notes. But we're gonna get the grape on its own. I did that on purpose. I wanna taste all these blends and then just kind of do the then kind of do the grape on its own to see what the grape brought to the blends. It's the darkest, I think, of, of all more than the most gold. It's also now they also could be the it could be the um, Corvin, but it looks cloudy. Not just like because there's you know argon gas in there, dissolved gas, but it looks a little cloudy. So this really brings that melon rind, cantaloupe rind aroma to it. Um, but it's really that's the dominant um, aroma. Touch of yellow apple, golden apple. But that's about it. All right, let's check it out. So there's a little bit of bitterness to it, um, like you are eating the cantaloupe rind. Um, you got the cantaloupe, you got the golden apple, um, a little bit of floral to it. Um, city's kind of high. I don't know. Let's see what if it tells us. So pH of 3.34, so that's on the low side. Total acidity is five, um, five grams per liter, which I think, I see, I don't really do it total acidity and they actually put tartaric acid so ta can either be total acidity which is all the acids or it can be tartaric acid because that's like the main acid you're getting anyway so i think five is like a fairly high number um i really i'm better with ph but ph is not an absolute measure of acidity it's different they use they're using different <clears throat> they're measuring different things Let's put it that way, to come up with the same concept. And it's $12, forgot to tell you that much. I like it a lot. It's the most bitter of the four. It's the wine that needs food the most. Um, it's 
I think the most linear in the fact that, or, 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 or not because I use linear on this one, right? But this one was had complexity. This one is um, more simplistic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just kind of like, man, this is, it's like, this is what I am. Hey, maybe because it's just, it's the one grape and the, the complexity is coming from the multiple grapes here. You know, it's like, man, this is what I am. Love me or leave me, but you know, drink me or something like that, right? I like it a lot. It's really tasty. Cool. Well, let's wrap this up. A lot of wine is on one setting. All right. So, um, click links above the friend me up. Click links below about, I'm going to have links to all these guys. They all have, they all, I think they all have pages. This last one, I didn't look for the uh, web, for the uh, winery webpage, but they all the other ones do. Um, hit the donate button over there. Uh, it helps send me to Oregon. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.